All right, today we have a very special guest. I have with me Dr. Jock Murray, who has a tremendous amount of experience in multiple sclerosis. He's had an illustrious career, and he's going to share with us some information about the history of multiple sclerosis and how things have changed over his career, and he continues to be active and productive. And just to give you some highlights of his career, he uh, actually started and founded the Dalhousie Multiple Sclerosis Research Unit, and he was, and during his career, professor of neurology and medical humanities, and was at one point the dean of medicine. He has over 200 publications, including multiple books, some that you might be interested in, and I'll include some Amazon links in the notes below, are Multiple Sclerosis, a guide for the newly diagnosed, and also for the history buffs, Multiple Sclerosis, a history of a disease, and that is the inspiration of my video on the Dina the Virgin. I'll post up a link. That is the first historical case believed to be consistent with multiple sclerosis in the 14th century. So thank you, Dr. Murray, for agreeing to come on and do the interview. My pleasure. So I guess we'll start off by just uh, maybe having you tell us a little bit about how you first came to know about multiple sclerosis, how you became interested in the field. I saw only an occasional case in early in my career. There was one case in the small town uh, where I grew up. I didn't see a single case while I was a medical student, but I did when I was a resident. And I did family practice in a small community for a number of years before I became a neurologist. And I did see patients then. When I first became interested in multiple sclerosis, I was doing a community study because a number of patients said, that in a region of our province, there were a large number of cases, and we decided to investigate that. The findings of that weren't as, as exciting as uh, we expected, but the thing I did learn was all of those patients out there felt abandoned. Nobody wanted to see them. They had no treatment for them. Their family doctor said they didn't know much about MS. Neurologists tended to diagnose the disease but not follow them and they felt they had no treatment. So I decided to start a clinic because we could care for them by explaining how they could manage their disease, by telling them what the disease was about, what their families could do, how they could understand the disease, what research was going on. There were things that we could do, and at least we could be there when they got into trouble. So that's how it all started. For the first two decades, I didn't have any treatment that altered the outcome of the disease. But we still pro provided care, education, and we did research. And that's why the clinic was never called a clinic, it was called a research unit. Patients knew that when they came, we were gonna do research to find out answers about MS. And so what did people think about multiple sclerosis at that time? What was the perception of the disease then? The perception of the, of the disease, and this is the term that was often used, that it was a death sentence. So neurologists thought they were being kind by not even telling the patients often that they didn't have that diagnosis. They made up other terms. Uh, some of them would explain it to the family, but not to the patient. Now, patients aren't dumb. They know they have a serious problem. And it doesn't take them long to realize that people are not telling them the truth. And so one of our jobs really was to explain to people really carefully what the problem was, what it meant, and how to manage it, and how they can take care of many of the problems themselves. But neurologists at that time didn't want to follow MS patients because they didn't think they had anything to offer. You know, and I know at that time, very little was known about multiple sclerosis, which is probably the reason you guys were doing that epidemiologic study looking for risk factors. And, you know, I talk a lot of, on my channel about nutrition and multiple sclerosis and some of the research behind that. And I know that you actually met one of the early pioneers looking for some kind of connection between nutrition and MS, who is Dr. Roy Swank, who, for people who don't know, he was a proponent of a low-saturated fat diet at Oregon Health Sciences University. And some people still follow his findings to this day, although they're very controversial. Can you tell us a little bit about Dr. Swank? Yeah, Dr. Swank was one of the early uh, individuals who really was interested in following MS patients. And he started here in Canada, in Montreal, started a clinic, uh, and he had the observation that uh, high animal fat might be related. And he followed patients, and he 
followed them on his diets, and he later moved to Oregon. But he continued to follow patients. Very nice man. Now, neurologists didn't accept the results of much of his work because it was not controlled. So you had a group of patients who seemed to be doing well, uh, but there were no controls to see what would they do if they didn't have the diet. And we also know that patients who aren't doing well drop off a study like that. So you end up keeping all the good patients and none of the bad ones. So he wasn't able to convince the general neurology community uh, of the value of this, but patients did follow it and still do, and his book is still in print. Now, I'd imagine, I'd imagine back in the day, even just diagnosing multiple sclerosis was very difficult. You didn't have access to MRI machines. What was that like? How could you make a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis? Well, neurologists got very good at all the subtle signs and symptoms. And so their job very often was to be a diagnostician, to carefully examine patients, to see if there were indications in many aspects that would allow you to diagnose the disease. But it was all clinical. And even when MRIs and other aspects of diagnosis came in, it was still a clinical diagnosis. These tests were just used to verify what you suspected. Uh, so neurologists were very good at that, but they could still make mistakes. And the reason they could make mistakes is there are other things that look like MS that aren't. And it was only when we got the MRI that would help confirm our clinical diagnosis and that we began to combine the two. You make the clinical suspicion and diagnosis, and you confirm that with the tests. So what was that like, that transition where we first started having MRI machines in the 1980s, and then later when we had available disease-modifying therapies, you know, beta Sierra and FDA approved in 1993, what was that like for a neurologist at the time? Well, the, the development of the MRI was dramatic in terms of of the demonstration of changes of MS. But even before that, we had CAT scans. <clears throat> but, but the CAT scan wasn't good at diagnosing MS. It was good at eliminating other things that looked like MS. So if there was a tumor or some other inflammatory disease, the CAT scan sometimes helped with that. But the MRI was dramatic in showing the changes and the changes over time. And you know, those initial drugs would never have been approved if it wasn't for the changes in the MRI, because they were so dramatic. The clinical changes weren't that dramatic. And if you want to show that a treatment is really beneficial, it takes many, many years. So the MRI was very helpful in being able to conclude clinical studies much earlier by combining the changes. Right, right. And, you know, when, when beta serum came out, were people very enthusiastic about it or were people very skeptical about it? I know there was a lottery and people were sort of begging and clamoring to get on these medications, even yeah. though the evidence wasn't that good. That happened very quickly. That The, the excitement about it um, was not so much about, I mean, if you read the papers, um, it, it isn't that dramatic. It doesn't cure or make the disease disappear. The thing that was most important was the hope that it gave MS patients. That after all those years in which it was, quote, a death sentence, and there was no treatment that would alter the outcome of the, the disease, suddenly we had a treatment that did alter the outcome of the disease. So it was the change, I think, in the hope that was more dramatic than the studies themselves. And the next few years, we got a number of other new drugs. And so things kept advancing. And up to the present day, we have over 15 new drugs. We have more in the pipeline. They're much more effective. They also have many more side effects and problems. But the things are advancing, I think, in a way that is really quite dramatic. And the thing that changed with the therapy was not the results. It was that sense of hope that families with MS in their family suddenly had hope that things were going to change, and they did. Yeah, it's crazy to hear this like paternalistic style of medicine where you don't even tell the patient what they have. Obviously, yeah. that doesn't really exist anymore. And so you think in that sense, things are a lot better for people with multiple sclerosis, right? They are, they are a lot better. I, I mentioned in, in the book on the history of MS, in 1970, 
two of the most prominent American neurologists talk about the fact that they didn't tell patients the diagnosis. They thought that was unkind, they couldn't handle it, that it was a death sentence. Uh, they did admit that they might tell the family if they were pressed, but they thought that was being kind. Uh, the other uh, dramatic change was um, the way patients were told. If you look at the patients in the 1970s and 1980s and ask them how they were told about the diagnosis, most of them are very resentful because they, they realized they weren't being told the truth. They weren't being told the whole story. Now that's completely altered now. We have whole programs for patient education. We want them to understand and know about this disease. They want, we want them to be full partners in managing the disease. That's a total change in the attitude uh, towards MS patients. Now, you know, there's this sort of stereotype that, you know, newer neurologists were like cowboys. We want to give these high risk but highly effective medications. Whereas maybe older neurologists are more conservative, they perceive that a lot of their patients actually do fairly well. They're very afraid of causing infectious complications. I mean, especially now during the COVID-19 pandemic. What was your thinking when you started to see these newer high-efficacy therapies, Novantrone, you know, which obviously can cause heart failure, promyelitic leukemia, and then later Tysabri? What were your thoughts on these newer therapies as they were coming in? Well, my, my thoughts were the new therapies were, in fact, much more effective. Now, we did know they were going to be associated with more serious side effects. The most important factor, though, and it was one that we really had to argue with some of the older neurologists, and at the time, I was one of the older neurologists, um, was to treat patients early. You know, when you first made the diagnosis, get the patient on therapy. It took a long time because many of them said, well, my patient is doing well without therapy. It took a long time to convince neurologists that when you think the patient is doing well, changes are still occurring. And you want to get ahead of all of that and treat patients even when they seem to be doing well, and you'll get better results. That took a long time to convince people early therapy was the key to this. I mean, I have a video, a time-lapse MRI, and someone who is stable over the course of the year is having an MRI every two weeks, and you can sort of see the dive bomber effect of new that lesions. Is the most, that video is the most effective education yeah. tool to show the change. Yeah, and I think you told me that even when beta serum came out, you know, a lot of the people who were started on it, they weren't really the best candidates for it. You know, maybe they had had MS for a really long time and, you know, maybe they were kind of transitioning to secondary progressive MS anyways. They weren't the best candidates for the medication, so it didn't work so well in a lot of people, right? No, that's right. Because if you imagine when the, in 1993, when it became available, all MS patients wanted to be on it. And that went from the mildest case to the person who's, been, who's bedridden. And so they were all tried, because at that point, there's no experience really with the, with the treatment. As time went on, we began to realize, and the patients began to realize, that if you're beyond a certain stage, there was no demonstrable benefit. And so, but, but the thing got answered just in time, because as time went on, all those patients either uh, progressed and all the patients going on therapy were now new patients, right? And so now, today, every patient is a new patient, and you have the opportunity to treat them early. But in those early days, we, we were pressured a great deal by patients who were the most concerned because they were now in wheelchairs mm -hmm. and wanted this new therapy. Right, right. It's almost counterintuitive. Like, in some ways, the best candidate may be someone who's young, healthy, a CEO, marathon runner type. They actually may be the best candidate for high efficacy therapy. And some of them thought, maybe I don't need the treatment because right, I'm right. so well. Right. And, of course, some people do do well off treatment, so it's all very confusing. Um, and when they see that video of the changes that are occurring, even when they think they're doing fine. Yeah, now you said a lot of good things. I'm pleased to hear that we're doing fairly well. We're making progress. But is there anything that you think maybe we're going in the wrong direction? Maybe we could learn from our predecessors, the older style of medicine. Well, the, the only thing I hope does not get lost 
is that clinical skill I mentioned that was present before we had the MRI. Because otherwise what happens is you transition to a, a time in which you depend only on the test. And so you don't spend the time doing that detailed history or detailed examination. You say, well, we'll just order the MRI. Well, you lose then the clinical aspect and you depend on the result of the test. But a lot of things on the MRI can look like MS and aren't. You need that clinical basis to determine how to interpret the MRI. So couple, the clinical should always come first and the most important. And the MRI is always subservient. It just is used to verify what you suspect clinically. We're going to get into big trouble if we just depend on the tests. That makes a lot of sense for sure. Now, you know, uh, we've made a lot of progress in terms of affecting the immune system for multiple sclerosis. But what do you see as the future of the field? Are we going to get better but safer drugs, or are we going to go in a totally different direction? Well, we know that in medicine things can happen that we wouldn't have predicted. But the progression right now is to find more and more targeted drugs that are targeted for specific aspects of the disease. That will continue and that will get better. Whether we'll see something that's quite unexpected. You see, we, we have dramatic results now with bone marrow transplants in MS patients. You can't give bone marrow transplants to all the MS patients, but you may learn things that allow you then to do something that you learn from the bone marrow transplants that don't require you doing bone marrow transplants. Uh, if we can get the same effect, doing it some other way. And so I think we'll learn from things like that. Um, and so that kind of research becomes very important. We also have to expect the unexpected. And so we know that the way medicine advances is it gets knowledge from all sorts of other areas. So the next advance in MS could come from someone doing research in a totally different area. And a lot of the, the results of um, studies on the immune system came from people doing rheumatology and hematology, cancer research, and uh, elsewhere. So we learned a lot from that. And that will continue to happen. So our next advance in MS may come from a totally different area of medicine. That makes a lot of sense. You never know what's going to change. I mean, things that were very promising didn't pan out, and then there were things that we never anticipated. Now, you mentioned okay. hematopoietic stem cell transplant, always a popular topic. I have a separate video on that if you want to take a look. Potentially high, very high efficacy, but with potential side effects if you want to learn more about it. Um, you know, the one last thing I wanted to ask you is, You've been doing this for a long time. You know, you have a lot of experience. What is the piece of advice? What are the pieces of advice you would give to someone with multiple sclerosis sort of in general from all of your experience? I, I, I think the best advice to an MS patient is that it is their disease and they are in charge and they take care of it. Use the neurologist, use the rehabilitation specialist, use the others to assist you. But take charge and be in charge of your own future. Anything else you wanted to add? I, I'm really pleased. I mean, I, I'm sharing the hope that we saw coming to the families and the patients with MS. I think the field is advancing in a remarkable way. Uh, to me, it was a great pleasure to be part of that, to see a change from something that didn't alter the disease to seeing a new therapy every year that's advancing the field. And I think we're going to continue to see that. And uh, it just delights me to see that the life of an MS patient now is so much better than it ever was before. Well, thank you for coming on and sharing all this wisdom with us. Again, if anyone wants to take a look at Dr. Murray's books, they'll be in the comments below. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, please post in the comments below. If you have a question for Dr. Murray, you can post it and I'll email it to him and see if I can get a response. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.